Acrylic Group welcomes you to the amazing Exec Show, where business leaders learn from other leaders. Join us, along with your host, David Rosen, the CEO of Acrylic Group. We discover and dive into stories from executives, founders, and owners and what separates them from success and failure. Hear and see amazing leaders from startups, middle market, and global leading companies. Now, kick back and enjoy watching our videocast or listening to our podcast. The choice of media is all yours. Come take this amazing journey with us and learn how great people do the thing they do. Welcome to episode 101 of The Amazing Exec Show. I'm your host, David Rosen. I would like to introduce you to Harry Moser, who is not only an amazing business leader and executive, but also is single-handedly with his team increasing the reshoring of U.S. manufacturing. He is the founder of reshoringnow.org program, or also called the Reshoring Initiative. Harry, I can't wait to hear more about that. Harry's prior background was grounded in manufacturing. He was previously the president of GF Machining Solutions for 22 years. He will share more about how he grew that business to acquire the number one leadership position and role in his industry. Harry has quite a broad set of industry awards and Hall of Fame introductions from Industry Week Association of Manufacturing Excellence, or AIM, and among most notably, Harry participated in President Obama's 2012 insourcing forum at the White House and engaged the man directly in conversation. Harry is an active speaker and often quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Forbes, and has spoken and been interviewed on national TV and radio. Welcome, Harry, to the Amazing Exec Show. (laughs) David, it's great to be here. (laughs) Thank you, Harry. I really love what you're doing. So tell us more about yourself, your company, your presidential role in manufacturing and about the Reshoring Now initiative. I could take the whole half hour. So uh, about myself, grew up in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, right across the river from New York City. The interesting connection there, the the biggest thing in town was Singer Sewing Machine. Their main factory for the world was there, two and a half million square feet. In its time, the biggest factory of any kind in the world Father worked there, grandfather worked there, I worked there summers. I went past 20 years ago and it's all, uh, as far as I can tell, nothing is made there, any, made in the U.S. anymore by Singer. Everything's imported. And, and during my career, selling machine tools, foundry equipment, company after company, industry after industry, I wanted to sell to went out of business, wiped out by imports, and I didn't get to sell them those things. And so I, I, I felt badly about how much our country had lost. And that was the motivating factor for me to, to eventually just start the Reshoring Initiative and reverse that trend and bring the jobs back. Now, nationwide, the number of manufacturing employees has been approximately cut in half in that time period. So the, and you were talking about number of establishments in the state of New Jersey. Now, clearly, New Jersey is now a relatively high cost state to do things in. And so to some extent, the work moved out of New Jersey and then it could be that the, the very small establishments disappeared and some of the bigger ones survived. So I, I would guess that manufacturing employment in New Jersey is, is maybe down 70%, whereas the nation's been cut in half roughly. And, and it's been driven primarily by, by the trade deficit, by, by the loss of work to offshore. Now, some has also been automation, productivity improvement, and that reduces the number of employees. But when you, if you look at autom- uh, the data on labor productivity in the U.S., uh, the last 12 years, I think it's averaged less than 1% per year, maybe even a half of a percent. And the scary thing is that the Chinese are raising their labor productivity at 6 or 7% per year. And therefore, their people are working at maybe a third the wage of ours, and they're getting more productive much faster than ours are. So we need to do a better job to bring the work back. Wow, so that's an amazing story. So you're saying that not only are they keeping up with the pace of manufacturing, but they're actually being more efficient and productive to get their costs lower. Not, there's a lot of different data on it. You know, traditionally Boston Consulting Group would say that we're three times as productive as the Chinese or or something like that. And partly, 
Part of the problem is in the definition, because when people look at labor productivity, they t typically look value added or revenue per labor hour. Okay. And, and the Chinese sell their labor or sell their product at 30% less than we sell ours for. And therefore that tends to drive down the apparent productivity of the Japanese factory because it's dollars per, per labor hour. They had the disadvantage that they started with nothing. So they, but then they can grow very rapidly from nothing. They've got the advantage that now their industrial infrastructure is in many ways superior to ours because it's almost all been built in the last 10 or 15 years, whereas we still have factories that were built 40, 50, 70 years ago. And we have a, the average age of our machine tools is older than theirs. They spend, I think, twice as much on CNC machine tools per year as we do. Although the Koreans have, I think, three times as many robots per thousand manufacturing workers as we do. The Germans are way ahead of us. So the U.S. has done a, a rather poor job so actually, Harry, that resonates with me. I recently learned that China is actually the largest market or buyer for automation and robotics. They have surpassed the U.S. in units consumed and are the largest purchaser of robotics. I guess even the Chinese realize they are no longer the low-cost producer in the world and they must keep up with automation. Is that right? It's a combination of they're no longer the low labor costs country. Yeah. And, but that's because of the one child policy, which went 38, 40 years ago. And therefore the, their actual workforce is dropping at about 3.5 million per year. And so the demand for labor keeps growing up as they go and the supply of labor is doing this. So the, the price of labor keeps going up and the availability. I heard a, I read an article uh, about quoting a Chinese factory owner and he said, it's really getting tough. All the kids want to go to university. They want to study art and music. Nobody wants to work in a factory anymore. But just the same thing that has happened to us over the last 30, 40 years is, is happening to every country as they get relatively richer. And specifically, finally, is, is happening to China. So tell me a little bit more specifically about Reshore Now and Reshoring Initiative. What do you do? What problems do you solve or what goals do you help our manufacturers and middle market companies to achieve? Yeah, but we, we help in th three or four ways. First, uh, first, our mission is to bring back 5 million manufacturing jobs, which is the 40% increase in manufacturing, what it would take to balance the goods trade deficit. And so we do it f four ways. First, we document the trend. So we know the number of jobs announced per year has gone from 6,000 in 2010 up to about 230,000 in 2020. So we, 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 the best way to get company B to decide to consider reshoring is to see that company A and company C and company D with whom they compete have done it and have succeeded and they're selling a price competitive product and it's working for them. Well, maybe we should at least do the math and see if it would work for us. So we document it, promote it. So I'm, I'm here <laughs> promoting and I'll do about um, 60 or 70 of things, something like this uh, every year. Uh, including now, again, a lot of in the field at conferences and trade shows speak. It's going to be at IMTS, the big machine tool show in Chicago, 130,000 people, huge, huge event coming up in September. So to promote, we write an, an art, two or three articles a month, uh, columns, Moser on manufacturing in four or five magazines. We do a lot of other articles for people. We get interviewed and uh, as we get the word out, so we promote and then we enable. So we have the, we have tools to help companies or to help governments help companies. So specifically the uh, TCO, Total Cost of Ownership Estimate, which helps a company. Most companies, when they decide where to buy something, a, a component, a casting, whatever, they look only at the FOB price. Where can I buy it cheapest? Yeah. And, and this, the TCO estimator starts with that FOB price and then it adds in the duty and the freight and the carrying cost of inventory and the travel costs and the intellectual property risk, the risk of stocking out, you know, all this. And it, when they get done with that analysis, it makes a huge difference. The, I took 190 cases of China versus the U.S. The user had compared a Chinese source to a U.S. source. And the, if, amongst those 190, the U.S. was the winner 8% of the time based on price, 32% of the time based on total cost. And if there happened to be a Trump 15% tariff, then 46% of the time. So just by doing the math correctly, by looking at all the relative factors and terms, we, we say that most companies would find that 20 or 30% of what they are importing 
they'd be equally or more profitable if they sourced here. So, so therefore, we'd say it's in a company's maybe patriotic interest to at least do the math. Now, I don't expect to lose money, but at least do the math and see what, what would make you more profitable if you brought it back and then start working, doing it. And you may find you have to automate. You may find you have to train your people better. You may have to find better people. To, but, but, but 20 or 30 percent should be relatively straightforward. And then a better automation, better planning, better design, maybe could get that up to 30, 40, 50 percent. At the same time, Harry, my experience in bringing products to market it's one thing to look at the model from an economic or timing perspective, but the reality is when I ask several of my investment companies to A, B, compare the onshore ver costs versus the offshore costs, it was always very clear that there was a 40, 50% difference in the actual. We'd say, we'd say price, difference in the price. And then, and then all this other stuff is what we call cost, just to keep them terminology clear. Very important distinction, Harry. Thank you. And so the prices would be 40 or 50 percent between different manufacturers. What wasn't accounted for was the one disconnect in communications because of the different time zones. It's very difficult to work in a 12 hour difference between your design team that may be in California or New York and yet working with your production engineering team in the Far East is an 11 hour difference. So you've got very few short hours to overlap. The second issue is the lack of coordination between design and fabrication and the first engineering sample. So typically when you move from your MVP or first prototype to your first engineering sample where you really start looking at the cost of manufacturing that in mass manufactured machines and tools that there's a lot of iter iterations that go on between your engineering team, your design team and your production team. And it's, again, more difficult to do that when you're halfway across. The, the third area is a lack of understanding of, <laughs> unfortunately, the calendar where it's we have to understand that they take an entire month off where manufacturing is closed for the Chinese New Year, as an example. And that can make a huge difference in how long it takes to get your products accomplished. At least from the startup environment where your volumes are not as high as ongoing manufacturers, there's a huge risk that you're going to be a third or fourth class citizen in that factory. If their largest customer comes to the plant and request that they need the plant for eight months at 100% capacity, you're going to be taking a seat back against that major customer to have access and production facilities in that plant. The results have been horrible. While the costs were lower in one case of my companies, there were two year plus delay in getting their product from campaign pre-orders to market. And how much is that really worth? in terms of the actual cost and the trade-off of getting a product to market and getting it embedded in the marketplace. Exactly. Chinese New Year. Yeah, the, 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 the factors that you mentioned are almost all included in our TCO estimator. The engineering, manufacturing, interaction, communication, travel, you know, all the stuff, it, it, it's, it's in there. On the other hand, now I've run into companies that tell me they go to China to get the prototype and to get the initial production because the Chinese factory reacts faster. You go to them with an opportunity, they're all over it. They got people working on it 24 hours a day. They get the sample back to you before the American company quotes on the prototype kind of thing. So, so they're hungrier over there still. And, and to me, that's an issue for us because especially when you get into real production, tons of stuff coming across by boat, for example, the, the US supplier, has an intrinsic advantage of proximity to the marketplace. Now, if he's somewhere within a couple hundred miles, he can deliver in a couple hours or a day. Whereas, especially now, an ocean shipment can take four months or something to get there. And if the US company gets the product out of its factory as fast as the Chinese company gets the product out of its factory, it's got three or four months advantage in terms of delivery. And we believe that looking at what we call manufacturing critical path time, which is a time from order until receipt of the product, that we believe that companies will pay 
moderately more to get that quick delivery, to be able to keep their, to be able to deal with just in time and keep your inventory low and, and yet know that you're not going to stock out because you've got a reliable supplier 50 miles or 100, 1,000 miles away that isn't going to get hit by dock strikes and weather and geopolitical issues and COVID. They're going to get you the product. You, and if, if it's not working, you drive over, you beat them on the head and say, I need the product. And so we, we believe, I think we've seen surveys of willingness to pay somewhat more for free, so to speak. And, and so we're working to put together a combination of that value and, and then these more quantified TCO factors and bring those two together and use those to help the uh, companies see the advantage. So without going into a pure product talk here, but how can people access the TCO model, Harry? Yeah, a TCO model is on our website, uh, reshorenow.org. And uh, you sign up, you sign in, it's free. There's explanations and examples and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you'd asked before what we offer. So I, I mentioned the TCO. We also have programs to help companies take advantage of it. So for big companies, if any of the listeners are uh, offshoring a lot or thinking of offshoring or thinking of reshoring, they can use the TCO. You can ask us to help train you to do it. If you're a smaller company or say that who's selling to bigger companies, you're selling machine parts or you're selling pumps or you know valves or fittings, something, and you're competing with imports, we have the import substitution program where uh, you can say, I'm really good at making these. And we can tell you, who the biggest importers are of these, what tonnage they bring in, whom they're buying them from offshore, roughly what they're paying for them. And then we train you to use total cost of ownership to knock on those doors and say, hey, you know, I've done the math. It looks look, from best we can tell, you'd be five points, 10 points better off buying from us and you'd sleep better at night. So let's get together and see if we can work this out in, in our mutual interest and in the interest of the country. That's all. Awesome, Harry. One last question, and then I'd like to come back to your manufacturing presidential role experience and talk a little bit about that. One of my principles in my investment thesis around startups and manufacturing is focused around the fact that one, demand is shifting from, I want something that's been mass manufactured to, I want something more personalized and distinctive just for me. I don't wanna wear the same thing that somebody else is likely to be wearing. And so it's either made in lower volumes and spread geographically, or it's actually made in principle for me through personalization or just one-off handmade design. You know, it, it, as an example, you may want that Camaro that you get produced out of a GM plant, but you might want uh, a full color spread of your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend on the new skin coming out of the factory and you want it customized. And these changes are also affecting the way products are being manufactured for that personalization or customization. And that includes the B2B markets and industrial products as well. And two, more importantly, what I've observed over the past 10 years is that manufacturers are moving closer to demand so that they can be more nimble and responsive to their customers and understand what changes and issues are affecting their decisions. And one example of that is the fact that all the X series BMWs are being made here in the U and they're being made specifically for the U S customer. And so if you want a Chrome handle and Chrome bumpers on your car, you can, customize that and and order that in your off of your smartphone or off of your browser but they're being more responsive to the customer and the other issue that occurs is that when you when the demand for the again uh, that's mostly designed for the US market that if the X5 demand is lowering then they will make up X1 X3 X4 X6 X7 and other parts for those other cars. Whereas when the Chevy Malibu demand wanes for Chevrolet, they shut the plant down for a couple of weeks. So are you seeing that affect the manufacturing industry today and the way in which manufacturers and the kinds of equipment that they're using to do that, Harry? Okay. So certainly the most modern uh, equipment, you know, flexible manufacturing kind of equipment makes that more possible than the hardwired systems that used to only be good at making one thing and took days or months to, to change them over. 
So certainly the automation IT in general supports that trend. The consumer say they want things customized. I don't have any data on it, but I believe that 97% of consumer purchases at like at super at department stores and so on and online, they're buying non-customized. You know, because what do they do? They go out, I need one, I need it today. And it, what's the cheapest or whatever, or made in the USA maybe, and, and they buy it. But there's been efforts made. Brooks, I think, and uh, New Balance uh, has a factory at which they'll customize a running shoe for you. And it's in the, it's in the United States, I think in New England. And they, you can send them your name, your logo, your whatever. And, and in a couple of days, you've got your size, my size 14. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's customized. Now, uh, shipping that in from China, or somewhere that doesn't make much sense at all. And or customization is one, it, it, again, if you look at our TCOS, placing a value on customization is one of the items that we ask the user to quantify and, and see. And, and it's in some cases, if you're buying steel or, or copper, or, you know, or grain, there's not much customization. Whereas if you're, if it's a personal apparel thing, or maybe the hood of your, your car, like you mentioned, then, then there's more interest in, in customization. So, so I think it's very real. I think there's still, it's still inevitable that costs will be higher and most people finally aren't going to pay the price. So I don't think it's going to be huge. There is a tendency towards finalizing the product near the consumer. So bringing in a partially completed product and then putting the last touches on it, the last details here in the United States. And I'd much rather have at least a portion of a loaf than none of a loaf. So I'd love to see customization is a is supportive of reshoring. I'd like to see more customization happen. Additive manufacturing, 3D printing is touted as a way to achieve that. That instead of having to buy fittings and valves and you know, things from somewhere, that you make them as you need them. You, you totally now now some things you can't uh, th 3D print uh, a television set. <laughs> But to the extent that it does work, then that can be a very supportive way of achieving what we're talking about. That reminds me of the 3D printed cars that used to drive around Maker Fair every year in New York. That was amazing. It was a big foot, a, a big six foot scarab robot arm that was making the car in full size and you had people driving it. But that necessarily isn't practical. No, it wasn't making the engine. It wasn't making the uh, headlights. So it's making, making the structural components of the car. Right. Although you could pre 3D print the two halves of an engine and the valves and metal using additive manufacturing, whether it's worth the money or not to do that is another question. But what really became apparent for me was the customization of cars where you can order a different handle type from BMW or Chevy over your smartphone app or on your web browser. You can order a bumper style and now Ford, by the way, is touting the fact that they would like to see you order, customize and order your vehicle and change from a rubber bumper to a chrome bumper, change all the different pieces and components. BMW did that early on as well. They make actually all their X series cars were made for the US market and they make them in South Carolina. And in fact, the X1 and X3, they're two smaller sizes of X vehicles were being exported back into Germany because they didn't have manufacturing capacity built for Europe and their German customers yet. And so for a while, up until about a year ago, we were exporting the X1 and X3s from South Carolina back to Europe. But the, the other issue that is very clear is that they've learned to be more customized and more nimble in their manufacturing so that if the X5 demand was waning, they could reconfigure their production lines to produce more X1, X3, X4, X6, and X7 parts and components. Whereas when the Chevy Malibu demand wanes, they shut the plant down for two weeks. We have to catch up to a different way of thinking about our manufacturing processes, skills, and culture, and produce more customized and personalized on-demand and responsive supply lines. Think Ford is taking a really strong initiative to see if they can help improve their market share from its already big, strong position today, especially in their trucks. Yeah. That goes in both directions. The changing consumer demand can say, make the stuff that they're actually want to buy. And 
the availability of the chips can tell you which models you can actually make because you have the components to make them. So, so the two directions in the supply chain can both in the pipeline can both influence that decision and make that an op a good optimization. So this has been amazing. Harry, since I met you 10, 12 years ago, I just really greatly appreciated what you've been doing to help people understand there are options that they have for manufacturing and look at ways in which they can maybe assemble here and manufacture and acquire components from elsewhere. And really the TCO model that you're giving to the manufacturing world to do this. And I've even talked to people in Eastern Europe or Europe where they're saying demand manufacturing is moving closer to demand. So it doesn't just mean for the US, it means, hey, look, if you're in Slovenia, the local manufacturing is going to be coming back to Slovenia for the Slovenia marketplace or the Eastern Europe marketplace. You need to make more things locally and you will be making and you'll be more likely to appeal to the changing demand of your and the same thing is throughout Europe and Australia and other markets in the world. So it's interesting. I'm going to ask you to put a different cap on right now and we're going to shift gears a little bit. I'd like to talk to you about your role in being in manufacturing as a president and I'd like to hear of the situations you were involved in as the president of GF Machining and talk about your role and what were the highlights that you had some great opportunities and learned as being a business leader of the system and the ecosystem. That was the best job I think anybody could imagine having. As you mentioned, I, when I came in 1985, the, the company was in disarray. The, the, it had just moved and didn't have inventory and the, the customer support was horrible. And the, the customers were mad and the employees were unhappy. It was one of these absolute disaster kind of places. And when I came in, and again, it was bad, but we, I think the thing I did best, I got to know the employees. What are you doing? What can I do to help? I, I also went out and I spent a lot of my time traveling with the salesman to the customer and out to conferences and trade shows where the customers were present. And so I met with you know, 100 customers a year, so 200, you know, a large number. And what are we doing? And they're frank because you know, they wanted us to help them. And I found where the issues were. And then we, we very aggressively went about fixing those issues, so phone service, uh, field service, spare parts availability, all, all these things that are absolutely essential for a capital equipment selling organization. And so we went from horrible in the areas to good. And then we got great. We got to the point where we were recognized as the the best machine tool company in the country in terms of these areas of support. And so we knew what these you know, 10 maybe variables were at metrics and we, we measured them. And, and in each of the departments, we posted the results. The department posted its results, for live phone support and all this kind of stuff. And so that everybody knew what we were working for. Everybody knew what the priorities were. And then we provided the sales team with all the metrics of what we actually had achieved. And so I, I remember one time, that we got a new a distributor who he had been a competitor distributor. He came to, came to become our distributor. He's from Michigan. And uh, I said, hey, Dave, let, let me take you on the tour. And yeah, I've heard all about the tour. I said, what's going to be heard about the tour? I said, well, when we were competing with the, for the customers, they'd come back after they did your tour. And you, and I, I gave the tour most of the time. And, and they'd say, they couldn't believe how well you were doing everything, how you had everything under control, how you measured it. They, you know, they, they're totally confident that your support was great. And they asked me, how's our spare parts availability? I'd say, good. <laughs> say, no, what's your phone response? Oh, excellent. Was were yours, they had statistics and numbers and they heard it from you and they believed it kind of thing. So that was a great feeling to take care of the customer. And, and then the customer said good things about us and the team believed it and we got more orders. And, we, and like you said, we went from seventh or eighth in seven or so years to be number one in the industry, which is all you can ever ask. Wow, that is awesome. So one of the things that I've realized over time in terms of leading change, whether it's been incremental change or whether it's been transformative, you can come up with these great metrics and you can come up with great processes and good rules. But in our, in our experience, it's the people issues that far exceed the impact of success or failure in any change that you're making 
compared to those smart business process or logic or rationale or decisions. Can you talk about what you did, what kind of things you were doing on the people side and how big was the organization when you started and where was it when you came into the company and what other people issues occurred and what business challenges were you fixing? I'm a little rough on the numbers because it's been a long time But when I, when I started, but let's say there were 50 people maybe when I started and maybe 150 when I left or something like that. But sales were up a factor of four or five or, or something like that. And, and, and you know, I, I, I fought myself. I, I was probably the micromanager at times and because I, I, I wanted everybody to, to succeed at what they were doing. And, and if they were not succeeding, I'd say, show me what you're doing. Let me help you see if we can figure out between us a way to do it better. And, and maybe, maybe a really good manager would just tell them to get it done you know, or don't come back kind of thing. So you know, those are two different styles. My style was to sit down with them and, and help them and come to some solutions. And it, it seemed to work. They achieved, they got the job done. They, when I run into these people on LinkedIn or go back to the company, they still tell me how, what wonderful it was when I was there. It was a great time and then they loved it. And then, they, and, and they still a good company, but they, I, from a lot of them, I get the feedback that, that we, we were one of the high points and, and that's a wonderful feeling to, to have the team value what you've done. And, uh, you know, but it was definitely, a, it wasn't a patent kill everybody kind of thing, you know, but it was a work with the team, be, be a team player, work, work with them, get, get them to believe. One of the things we did that I thought was just it really worked since we were really a selling organization, we had a cash bonus for every time we exceeded a, a month's record orders. Or a, or a quarter's record orders or a year's record orders and month after month, quarter after quarter, year after year, cash being handed out to people. And, and, and so towards the end of each of these periods, they'd come say, Harry, what do we have to do to get another? And, and that's the motivation you want your people to have. You want them to be aligned with, with getting the objective, achieving the objective and have, have that be right, right at the top. How, how are we going to get this thing over across the goal line kind of thing? And, 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 it, and it worked. Maybe I was the right in the right place at the right time, but then I know it worked. Are there other ways that you motivated people to get aligned with what you were doing in terms of motivating people through their wallet is the natural incentive that people give, but the other ways of motivating people are also through their hearts and mind. Did you do anything like that? I'd say we, I was very, I was very hesitant to terminate if, if someone was doing something illegal or, or just horrible, they, they were gone. But basically I worked with people and I, I was loyal to them because I believed if I was loyal to them, they'd be loyal to us. And that, that seemed to work. Some people would have done it differently. That worked. C communication was an important part of it. We had a, I can't remember now if it was a monthly or a quarterly employees meeting and got all or as many as you could get off the phones and so on and get out of the field to be there and review what are our accomplishments, what are our problems, how P&L right down to the, the penny kind of thing so they could see what was actually happening. And, and therefore they were part of the team, they knew that. Now, let me give you a contrast. I ran a small company before that. We had a, a steel workers union, I think. And I, do, I started doing the same thing. This is 40 years ago, this is 50 years ago, <laughs> long before the modern. And I'd come up and I'd present the results and the finish. And I was talking to one of the union guys and he said, I'd say, we have to do something about this model. He said, what do you mean? I, said, I told you at the employee meeting, that's the one we're losing money on. He said, we don't believe a word you tell us at the meeting. Because <laughs> because they'd had so many presidents come through and lie to them. I don't know what, but, but you know, it, it was with that group, it was hard to get their heart and soul aligned, at least with this guy. And as I'm sure some of the others, whereas with the, the team I had at, at, in Illinois, maybe because I had more experience, but maybe it was the right group of people, but everything gelled and, and it worked. Harry, right now, some of the feedback that comes from large companies today, even like Google, is that people want transparency. They want to hear and see and understand that they're a part of what they're a part of and what's happening. And so you're sitting there in the middle 80s where that was just the beginning of that open transparency movement and how well you were doing. What are our leading metrics or what are your lagging metrics? The second thing that people are looking for today is one of the top five or 10 things that employees look for is a safe place. 
to be able to have a dialogue or discussion and not be worried about getting fired. And so you provided hesitating to let people go, but work with them, maybe put them in their best place. If they're the wrong person and the right job, find out a way to put them as the right person in the right job is what I hear from you. Is that, yeah, that actually is one of the points I was, I was going to make about recommendations to people is if you're in a job and you're not happy, you, you should work with the boss and try and find a way to redesign the job so you become happy. And, and I, I was almost always happy. And, and I think if people do that, instead of just being depressed about it, I think most of the time you can make an improvement. And if you can't, if you can't find a, another slot, another way to do it within the company, then you should leave and go somewhere else. But I, I found that if you worked with the people, that they worked with you. And it was it. You, we were able to make it happen. Harry, let's talk about your role as president of manufacturing company GF Industries. You have some great stories and perspectives to share. Any big epiphanies? Oh man, I'm never going to do that. I'd say we, again, probably by micromanage too much. You know, there were too many cases where we're probably, you only have so many hours in a day and I was putting too many hours in probably were, and, and maybe that took, that took a little of the self-reliance away from people. If you're always there with the backdrop, always there with the safety net, then they don't develop the, the, the moral fortitude and the courage that they need. So that, 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 was, that was, if I had to do over again, I'd try not to do so much of that, even though it worked. Other than that, in, in, I, I probably almost got fired in the beginning. We, and maybe I was a year in and we built up this inventory of products and the you know, machine tools, expensive machine tools from the factory. And the fellow that I had hired and put in responsible for that, he was just ordering according to the budget, ordering, having some influence of what we were actually selling and forecasting, you know, and corporate was all over me. And, and, and again, that was horrible. And so we, we learned quickly and we got better. That was maybe one of the things that told me that you have to look a little closer at what people are actually doing and see if it's, if it's if, especially new people and, and when a whole team's new. We live and learn, so we don't repeat our mistakes. That's always the first challenge. So what would you do different? Well, probably I, like I, when we're working on accounts receivable, I'd work with the CFO and then also with maybe two, two people in his team who are actually doing the day-to-day -day accounts receivable. And, and probably I should have worked with the CFO and then not going to the meetings with, with him and his team. Although sometimes it turned out I was the one that called the customer because I knew the customer. I said, Bill, you got to pay the, you got to pay. And we got the money. And, and if anybody else called him, maybe we wouldn't have gotten it. But pr probably I, there were cases like that where I should have uh, counted on my, the chain of command and let him or her have that responsibility and not not helped as much down into the team. But on the other hand, help, helping with the team, develop the relationship with the team and the transparency of the, <laughs> gave them confidence and it, and it worked. Harry, tell us something about yourself that you think most people may not know about you. Okay, I, I got two things that are, I think are interesting. One, between my senior year and, grad, and graduate school and college, uh, I bicycled from Munich to Athens and back. So 3,000 miles. With a fraternity brother, Great, wonderful trip. Saw so Athens, saw so, uh, all kinds of Munich, all kinds of wonderful places. And then the second thing that almost nobody knows that about when I was about 30 or 30, the Equal Rights Amendment proponents had something called the Great American Male Beauty Pageant, the second annual Great American Male Beauty Pageant, in which I and I had five, five seconds flexing on network news that night. <laughs> oh my God, that's awesome. So you were a bodybuilder at the time? I worked out every day, I still do. And some of the guys were in much better shape than I was, but my poses were better. That is too funny. Something we can lean on for a while. <laughs> Let's switch gears again. One of the things that we're looking to understand is how people are thinking about supply chain, manufacturing, assembly, packaging, service, maintenance perspectives. What should CEOs be thinking about today and how prepared for a crisis were you, were your companies and others for the COVID-19 pandemic? How well prepared were you guys for crisis or change or inflection points that your business was going to hit? And you pulled out a playbook and said, okay, here's what. No, I'd say we're nowhere near as cognizant of it and, and organized and prepared as, as one should be now. The world was simpler back 
30, 25, 30 years ago. We had the customer support side was in good shape. If we'd lost 10 people or if a whole bunch of companies had been hit with problems and needed help, we could have dealt with that. But the availability of machines, you know, if all of a sudden the factory had shut down and no machines were available, we just weren't going to sell, ship any machines and there was nowhere else to go because we, we only made them in our factory. I'd say we, we were a relatively simple organization in a sense, and but we were not risk prepared. So let's look forward now. So we're in 2022. And my question is, what's the prognosis for looking forward in manufacturing now that we may be closer to the endemic of the pandemic? We've got states that are demasking and devaccinating. We're pretty open these days. And some are not asking for vaccine cards. And we will probably just treat this like the flu going forward. So tell us about your thoughts for 2022 and 2023 and in the future. Makes a lot of sense. So it's not always the best decisions are not always to re reassure, but they need to be an option and consideration one. But two, the option is really to diversify because we also learned about how much of the critical but commodity pharmaceuticals are being made in China today. This is a paradox. China is the place that buys premium baby formula at $90 a can, since the Chinese population knows that the water in those cans are coming from either the US or Europe. The Chinese recognize that they don't want their children to have Chinese water in their baby formula. At the same time, is that where we're having our pharmaceuticals being made and using the water as a part of the production process? And where are our concerns about that? That just puts me a little bit on uneasy. We believe that companies have, have learned a lesson from COVID and the uh, disruptions that have happened with the boats and everything else. And so we, we believe they've learned that. Now, like any learning, you go up here, you, you're, you're pretty good, and then you gradually it falls away like this. But I believe that the, especially with China, that we're going to have tension with China for you know, 20 years, 50 years, tension with China. And specifically, there's been talk of decoupling with China. And the, the, there's a bill in Congress, the, I think it's the make, Making the U.S. Competitive Act, something like that. And, and it talks a couple of things about how to become more competitive with China. And, and when that bill was introduced, the Chinese government announced, if you pass that bill, we will stop shipping product to the United States, including, for example, automotive components. You can, can you imagine our industry if all the stuff that the Oh, the OEM received and all the stuff their suppliers in the U.S. received from China stopped. I mean, stopped and didn't start again forever. I mean, apocalyptic. It'd be existential. And I don't see that going away because of the because of Taiwan. There's going to be tension over Taiwan until it's finally resolved. And as that happens, one of the ways the Chinese will pressure us is something. It's the threat, at least, of doing things like that. So companies that are dependent, especially on China, will continually be reminded. I mean, there's going to be a burr under their saddle, so to speak, and they're going to have to think about it and at least make use something like our TCO estimator to see what they should pull out of China and at, at least put some somewhere else, or, or ideally because somewhere else can have problems too, to, to bring as much of it as you profitably can back to the United States. We think that alone will keep the visibility high and companies being responsible. Makes a lot of sense. So it's not always the best decisions are not always to re reassure, but they need to be an option and consideration one. But two, the option is really to diversify because we also learned about how much of the critical but commodity pharmaceuticals are being made in China today. This is a paradox. China is the place that buys premium baby formula at $90 a can, since the Chinese population knows that the water in those cans are coming from either the US or Europe. The Chinese recognize that they don't want their children to have Chinese water in their baby formula. At the same time, is that where we're having our pharmaceuticals being made and using the water as a part of the production process? And where are our concerns about that? 
that just puts me a little bit on uneasy. I agreed. Rosemary Gibson, I think, has, has done the most the best research on that, testified to Congress. It's, it's been a disaster. It's been ridiculous for our country to allow us to be there. There, there are steps being taken. There's pharmaceutical production coming back, reshoring, and that's great. If, if China decided to stop shipping us the either the pharmaceuticals or the active ingredients that go into them, we'd have people dying all over the place because they couldn't get the pills they need to you know, to, to stay alive. And that's crazy. And because the, the manufacturing cost, there isn't that much labor in making pharmaceuticals. It's one thing to say television sets and to think so if somebody has to go like this, but if the some of the pharmaceuticals is a batch processor, can't be that much labor and it can't be saving them that much. And for the pharmaceutical industry specifically, given that they that their price for the name brand pharmaceutical products here is 50 to 100 percent higher than in the other developed countries, and then not even make the stuff here, that's insulting. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> it doesn't make sense at all. These are interesting challenges. But what are you most excited about over the next year or two, and what advice can you share with business owners. It's a chance to rebalance supply chains and manufacturing process, not just about reshoring, but also to look at diversifying to other countries outside of China for manufacturing. I would, I, I'd first, eventually I'd use the, the TCO estimator or something like that to do a, an in-depth analysis of all the relevant costs. Look at the delivery times, very important. And then I'd make sure that wherever I was getting the product from, that company, wherever it is, Vietnam, India, was did not have significant Chinese components coming into it. Because the, the, everybody understands it makes sense not to be getting everything out of China. But if you're getting it from someone who gets most of their stuff from China, then you're still dependent on China. And and I don't, I don't labor China, but it, it's the obviously the biggest opportunity, for example, about 40, 50 percent of the reshoring has been from. So even though they're, they've been the low labor cost country, very productive, overall do a good job. They have most of the half or more of the reshoring that's actually happened. And most of the analysis using the TCO estimator has been about China are thinking about it. They are you know, and hopefully acting to to bring substantial amounts of that work back to the country. So I'd say do the math, try not to be dependent on, have some, one thing I'm very enthusiastic about is ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Okay. So on the environmental side, we did a study of a, an aluminum die casting made in China and shipped here versus made here, from both cases for the US market. And by, because the Chinese electricity system is so uses so much coal for its production, and because you then have to ship it here, the combination of those two result in the Chinese option producing 25 to 50 percent more CO2 than the U.S. option. So now we're we're starting to add that factor into the TCO estimator, and we're, we're try, trying to do is come up with three, four, or five industries in which we've done that analysis. And then say, okay, pick where you, your product is between die castings, which is electricity intense and heavy versus say chips, maybe, and a couple of things in here, pick yours, and then come up with some estimates, a real rough initial estimate of what the ESG impacts are going to be of moving the work back. So put some value, we're not saying huge amount of value, but some value on your societal responsibilities. You've provided such a great articulation about the value of ESG. It's very practical thinking. I'm not sure why, but ESG, in my opinion, appears to be have become a highly politicized and emotional issue more than an economic or business one. At the beginning of offshoring in the 80s and 90s, I remember looking at the geopolitical and government issues that were occurring at that time and things like country values. And I remember discussing the likely outcomes of whether companies, if they put their manufacturing facilities in another country, what's the likelihood that they would be nationalized or not? Those were the risks at the time being considered. And today you're making a good point. If you look at the impact of the environment, that could be looking at something that is five times or 10 times higher in terms of impact to the environment and the draw of, of coal or draw of resources that are finite. And that may not be reasonable when you look at the total solutions. And that 
is where ESG is a way to balance with the political situation and the environmental issues that could make much greater sense in terms of your value proposition to your customers. But at the end of the day, it's a much smarter decision because you're putting less pollution into the environment. So we've got a, a team of University of Michigan graduate student interns who are putting together our ESG business plan to, to, to how, how to get this message and how to incorporate it in our TCO estimator and then how to get the message out. Because most of the ESG message is, is very, as you say, political or you put solar panels on your roof and do this and do that and help the poor and do it, all of which are good things. But I've never seen anybody in the ESG community mention when they do these ratings for companies. It's how we, I've never seen them once say, what country do you, do you, how much of your product is sourced from China, Venezuela, what have you? And that's a more obvious thing that they should have. And, and so we're, our intent is to raise the flag and get the attention of these groups so that factor gets into play. Now, another way of looking at it, you've heard of the business roundtable, 180 top CEOs. They came out in 2019 and said, now, from now on, stakeholders includes not just shareholders, but the community, the supplier, and the employees, okay? For a manufacturing company, what's the best thing you could do for all those? Reshore and put your people back to work. Harry, what's your favorite business book? Do you have one that comes to mind? You know, actually, I've never gotten the time and the interest to read them. You know, what I do seems to make sense. The, the closest thing to a business book that I could think of, since I, I'm, I'm deeply into communication, it's called, it's a book on speeches and, and it's called, and presentations, it's called Give Your Speech, Change the World. And so you don't make a speech, you give it because you give it to the audience you, and, and you change the world because there's no sense of them listening unless they're going to do something different because of what you, you've given them. So that's the closest thing to a business uh, book that I've ever actually completed. Harry, how can people reach you or find you online? Thank you. Harry.moser at reshorenow.org. Website is reshorenow telephone 847-867-1144. Very active on LinkedIn. So you look up Harry Moser, you, you should be able to find me okay. And we're posting there all the time. We do a fair amount of Twitter and some Facebook, but I'd say LinkedIn is very active, very well. Sometimes we'll put up an article or, or say a posting of, some, of an event like this and thousands. And one time I think we had 13,000 views or something like that. So I was, I said, it's fun. This has been great, Harry. I've really enjoyed spending time with you. We could go on for hours. I have a feeling maybe blah, 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 blah. Start that over. This has been great, Harry. I've really enjoyed spending time with you. We could go on for hours. I have a feeling maybe we'll have an update with you next year and understand what's going on in the reshoring. But for now, thank you for taking the time with us. And I look forward to watching your progress. Thanks, David. It was a lot of fun and the audience look forward to hearing from you, helping you to hear about your reshoring cases or help you achieve them. Thank you for watching and listening. We really look forward to hearing from you about 1. Your thoughts on our guests and their insights. 2. Identifying speakers that you want to hear from. 3. What did you learn and take away from this event? And were you able to apply something you learned immediately back in your organizations and role as a balanced leader? You can always subscribe to get our event and guest schedule, as well as access to previous programs at our website at https colon slash slash www.acrelicgroup.com slash e while there. Leave us your comments and thoughts or if you want to explore your goals needs, and challenges, schedule a complimentary call with us. Have a great day and be a balanced leader.